In this introductory video, I'm going to be talking about the principles of palliative treatment in the stage four or recurrent after perioperative therapy setting. I'll also introduce the concept of treatment resistance and the, the thought of changing therapy to different so-called lines of therapy and with the overarching goal of personalizing therapy to each individual patient based on their characteristics and their actual individual goals. In previous videos, we talked about the staging of the cancer and the importance of doing so to really differentiate between a curative setting or localized still versus a metastatic setting. It's already spread outside of a surgical field or so-called uh, palliative setting. So we're going to be focusing on the next set of videos of optimal treatments in the stage four palliative setting. In the principles of chemotherapy video, I introduced all the different uh, classes of chemotherapy agents, some of the examples of the actual drugs in each of the classes, and talking about how combining those different chemotherapies leads to optimal disease control in various regimens listed here that we're going to talk about. In the principles of clinical trials, I started to introduce why chemotherapy is used, and we alluded to historical data sets showing that no active therapy for the cancer or best supportive care had median survivals of around three to six months. Median, again, it's important to understand what that means. It just means that if you look at a large group of patients, that half of the patients are still alive and half of them are not. And that goes for any median survival that we discuss here and, and in future videos is that it doesn't indicate what's going to happen to any one person. Some people do much better than these medians, and unfortunately, some do worse. And this is just the halfway mark. But regardless, it is a good measure for us to compare newer therapies to see if we can improve that median survival. I'm also going to point out the concept of the tail of the curve or the far end of a survival curve, which shows that there's always a subgroup of patients that do exceedingly better than these medians. And we like to highlight that because it really plays a role in when we talk about personalized therapies. So regardless, with our best chemotherapy treatments that we're going to go through, um, typically a doublet chemotherapy or two chemotherapies used together, namely a fluoroprimidine and a platinum agent, the median survivals in, in most phase three studies range around 10 to 12 months. Now, we're going to be talking about also targeted therapies and immunotherapies for specific groups. Uh, but really, when we're talking about chemotherapy, this is still pertinent for the all negative group. And also, of course, for each of the targeted therapies, they're added to the backbone chemotherapy. And so this chemotherapy discussion really it plays a role for all patients. We mentioned in the principles of clinical trials video that the reason why we use chemotherapy is, of course, because it improves that median overall survival time. But really importantly, it improves symptoms. It's palliative. And so counterintuitively with the negative connotation of chemotherapy and side effects that could occur, is that it actually makes most patients feel better because most patients don't feel well from their cancer, they're symptomatic, and the treatment itself is improving on those symptoms like pain or dysphagia, problems with swallowing, et cetera. And so that's the goal in uh, the stage four setting is to improve quality of life, to improve on the cancer-related symptoms, all the while trying to limit side effects from this, the actual therapy. And the standard therapies that we're going to go through in the next videos are based on a number of clinical trials that have been conducted over the last decades. And at any given time point, when a new regimen of therapy showed that it was more effective than a prior therapy, then it became the new standard approach at the time. And again, just to really emphasize, the goal of therapy is to improve survival, yes, but also to improve the quality of life during that time and by limiting side effects of the therapy. A common question when I'm discussing these principles with patients who are newly diagnosed and we're talking about the basics of therapy and the rationale of therapy and the goals, 
The follow-up question is, so does that mean I need to be on therapy forever? And the answer to that, as you're going to see in the next videos, is sort of. When we think about our therapies, we're really always trying to balance um, the advantages of the potential benefits of the therapy and the disadvantages of the potential side effects from the therapy. And so most patients start first-line therapy. There are some patients that maybe they're really elderly or they're very ill and not able um, to really start therapy, but it really doesn't account for most patients. I would say that only occurs in about 5% of patients. There's always um, some therapy that could be considered to help palliate patients for the most part. And so the goal is to start with standard treatment at standard dosing that we're going to go through. And the ideal situation is that the cancer becomes well controlled and side effects of the actual therapy are manageable. So we've optimized quality of life. After a period of time, we would always reassess uh, both by asking, how are you feeling? Have your symptoms improved? Which gives us a clinical uh, indication of whether or not the treatment's working, but also we use objective measures with blood draws, with serum, tumor markers, CTDNA we've talked about, and most objectively at the moment with repeat CT scans to assess the size of the cancer. And so putting that all together, both the clinical symptoms, tumor markers, and the clinical scan results, we make an assessment. And if it appears that the treatment is working, um, but uh, side effects are a problem. In that situation, uh, we would consider dose modifying the treatment. It's working, but we would consider decreasing the dose of the therapy on future cycles to limit the side effects and put us back in balance with uh, our optimized quality of life. I put here, there may not be any side effects from the treatment and the treatment's working. And for a period of time, we would continue that therapy. But as you'll see in the video, when we talk about monitoring the, the treatment during each line of therapy uh, or so-called maintenance approaches, um, we often um, give treatment holidays completely from the therapy for say six to eight weeks or treatment modifications where we go to a maintenance therapy. We drop from two drugs to one drug, for example. And so this is always with the intention of trying to balance uh, our overall quality of life, limiting side effects, especially cumulative side effects that, that get worse with each dose. And we know that it's coming if we were to continue course. And so if we have the situation where the therapy is working and we're fortunate to be in that scenario, then it is common to uh, administer breaks, holidays, or maintenance therapy. Regardless, on the other side, if at any time it is deemed that the therapy is not working with or without side effects, then you know we have to consider changing course. If it's during a break, then the logical thing would be to resume the previous therapy. It didn't grow uh, on that therapy. It grew while on a break or maintenance. Um, on the other hand, if it's during a full course of any line of therapy, including first line therapy, then the situation would be not working and to change to the next line of therapy. So why do we do this and why am I talking about changing therapy? There's the concept of generating treatment resistance. The cancer cells over time um, will ultimately become resistant to any line of therapy, including first line therapy. Um, few experience cancer progression immediately after you know a few cycles of therapy, uh, after a few months when we do our first check, usually, uh, patients have at least control of their cancer. It's not growing. And a subset of them will have actual shrinkage uh, by our measures has to be a 30% or more shrinkage from what we started. Uh, so this is where I usually say, you know, as, as much as this has been very difficult with your diagnosis and hearing all of this uh, news, odds are actually in your favor after we start therapy that it will actually be accomplishing what we wanted to, and that is to control the cancer and improve symptoms. And so the other thing to really note is that some patients have remarkable responses, complete responses. It can't be visualized on scans anymore. And although that's not that common, you know, I'd say in most studies, 
it's usually less than 5% of patients, but there is a real complete response rate with just standard chemotherapy. And these would be called exceptional responders. And usually uh, they do very well and exceed that median survival estimate. Regardless, if and when treatment resistance occurs, which again is an expectation over time at some point, um, it is recommended if the patient's willing to and they're strong enough or uh, well enough, which we call the performance status, to change to the next line or second line chemotherapy. The goals of second line therapy are the same as the first line, balancing act between controlling the cancer, improving or delaying the onset of symptoms, and at the same time, trying to limit side effects from the actual therapy. Again, uh, th there's an expected response rate and disease control rate and overall survival rate. Again, these are medians. Some people do better than this. And unfortunately, some patients do worse. Um, but eventually, we would expect that there would be disease progression on second line therapy. Something to note is that the response rate upon changing to second line therapy is typically lower than would be with first line therapy, which on the previous slide was around 40 to 50% in most studies. Um, with standard uh, first-line therapy. So there is a response rate, but it generally decreases a little bit with the next line of therapy. The thought there being that even though the cancer has not been treated with this newer treatment, it has gained the capability of being multi-drug resistance just by getting the first-line therapy. Regardless, when it's time, we would switch to third-line therapy or higher, et cetera. Um, and with the same goals overall to improve quality of life, control the cancer, improve symptoms, delay the onset of symptoms, um, and limit side effects as best as possible. But eventually, treatment uh, resistance will emerge again with the, each line of therapy. You can see again that the response rates with third-line available therapies is a little bit lower yet than in the earlier lines, as are the outcomes for progression-free survival and overall survival. So this is an overview of the treatment strategy through the different lines of therapy from newly diagnosed setting of stage four or recurrent uh, disease after perioperative therapy or unresectable disease and the thought process that goes through it in each line of therapy with biomarker testing and matching to the appropriate targeted therapy or if uh, negative for all the appropriate biomarkers, then chemotherapy, and then transitioning to later line, second line, and third line. And we're gonna go through each of these in uh, individual videos for each of the specific biomarker groups and for each line of therapy. So again, in any of those lines, in any of those subgroups, the overall goal is always to balance between controlling the cancer and limiting side effects in order to optimize quality of life and really, it's a personalized approach to any individual, what their overall goals are, and, um, and what uh, it is felt that the best treatment would be at any given situation. We'll also, of course, introduce biologic therapies or targeted and immunotherapies that superimpose on top of the chemotherapy when appropriate in each of those lines of therapy. In the principles of clinical trials, I showed you that um, we have come a ways from best supportive care decades ago with the introduction of different regimens and therapies, monotherapy, double therapies, and um, later line, second and third line, et cetera, as well as the introduction of targeted and immunotherapies for specific biological subgroups that have improved the median survival incrementally over time. And so as I also pointed out, there's always room for improvement on these benchmarks, but uh, it certainly is better than no therapy in a patient who otherwise could proceed and get therapy. And I showed you a goal um, of other tumor types like colorectal cancer, which started around the same um, outcomes without any therapy, but because various agents are more effective, there are more agents available in colorectal cancer, um, median survivals in some some groups are uh, around th three years now. With the introduction, uh, hopefully uh, through clinical trials of newer agents that are successful, this is the ultimate goal is to continue to improve 
until, of course, we get uh, therapies that are eradicating the cancer. But in the meantime, this is the best that we have, and um, it is better uh, than the alternative of not getting any therapy. And, and it really speaks to why clinical trials are always encouraged in any line, in any situation in this setting, because uh, there is some room for improvement. So in this introductory video about uh, giving therapy in the stage four and unresectable or recurrent uh, situations, uh, we talked and introduced about therapy lines, treatment resistance, the goals of therapy in terms of optimizing quality of life by treating the cancer and limiting side effects from the treatment, and ultimately personalizing any therapy regimen to the given individual and their goals. So in the following videos, we're going to talk about specifically um, chemotherapy, uh, both two drug and three drug regimens, and then go into each of the biomarkers and their matched targeted therapies and immunotherapies when indicated.